Good evening. Welcome to the Columbia University uh, NUNT1 lecture on the Chinese economy and business, sponsored by uh, Weatherhead East Asia Institute, Columbia Business School Chasen Institute of in uh, International Business, uh, and the China and World Program, housed at the School of International Public Affairs. My name is Xiang Jingwei. Uh, I'm the NT1 professor of uh, Chinese economy and business at uh, Columbia Business School and School of International Public Affairs. Professor Nian Zhu Wang, or NT Wang, in whose honor this lecture series is named, was a tireless uh, champion for better understanding of China, Chinese economy, US-China relationship uh, in uh, academia. He was a beloved member of Columbia community. He had a play a very important role in bringing together scholars researching on China, practitioners from both public sector uh, and, and, and the business sector together for conversation, uh, exchange of views. I'm very happy I uh, miss Cynthia Wang, the daughter of uh, Professor N.T. Wang, uh, uh, who is able to join us today, representing Wang family. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you very much for, for coming. There's never a shortage of uh, challenges and opportunities uh, for any aspects of, of our China, Chinese economy, China's relationship well, with uh, other, uh, other uh, countries. Um, and Colombia has been an intellectual leader on any important aspects about, uh, about uh, China. For example, just uh, next Monday, uh, uh, the International Affairs uh, building, uh, room 918, uh, from, no, not room 19, so the new room. We, uh, the, there will be an event, uh, but the event is so popular, they have moved to a bigger room on the 15th floor, 1501. Yeah. 15th floor of the International Affairs building, which many people think is SIPA, but it's actually the International, International Affairs building, uh, top floor of the, uh, of the building. There will be an event uh, on um, on uh, the 20th uh, Congress of Chinese Communist Party, implications for China and the world, uh, featuring uh, many uh, Columbia faculty experts, uh, including Professor Tom Christensen uh, here. So you're welcome to join us uh, at that event uh, uh, as well. Now to understand what's going on uh, in China or China's relationship with US and other countries now, one can also benefit from uh, having, a, uh, having a historical view, having a long-term view. Therefore, today's uh, topic uh, uh, is uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, a 19th century US law, and its long-term impact on the US economy. I'm very delighted uh, to introduce to you tonight's uh, speaker, Professor Nancy Chen. Like Professor N.T. Wang, uh, Professor Chen was born in Shanghai, but grew up uh, in the US, uh, Texas, uh, I, I believe. Uh, obtained her PhD in economics from uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, uh, taught at the Brown University and Yale U University, and then uh, moving uh, in 2017 uh, to Northwestern University to become a James J. O'Connor Professor of Economics uh, at the Northwestern's uh, Kellogg School of Management. Uh, Professor uh, Chen uh, is known for her extremely creative uh, and uh, um, uh, cre cre creative and influential work in many, many fields, not just on uh, uh, topics related to Chinese economy, but about economic development uh, in general, about political economy determinants of uh, long-term uh, uh, long growth. And she has published, as you might imagine, in all the top uh, um, academic journals, but she has also published uh, in, in many uh, popular outlets uh, as well, uh, including Wall Street Journal, spoke, uh, having spoken on national public radios, and she has been recipient of many prestigious awards and grants. Um, without further ado, uh, let, let, please join me in, uh, in welcoming our speaker, please. Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, so I was told that this talk is an hour, and it's usually um, 
So it can be, Shang Jin just told me it's up to me. I can do like 35 minutes and then Q&A or you guys can ask me questions during. So being an economist and being used to people interrupting me all the time very aggressively and asking me questions, I welcome any question at any time. But if you don't ask me questions, then we can have a lot of time for Q&A. I promise not to take up all the time with a lot of slides with a lot of numbers. Um, okay, so thank, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this uh, It's very special to be invited here for several reasons. Uh, one is, you know, this is, Columbia is just such an amazing academic institution and it's a great place to get feedback from my work and comments. And also, you know, this is just such an important time, I think, for furthering our understanding of the Chinese economy, of the Chinese, the, the long run relationship between China and the U.S. And also, you know, um, when I was invited to give this talk, I did some research to see who N.T. Wang was. And it was extra special to have the sense of continuity, you know, like, like Shan Jing said, being born in China and then moving to the U.S. later and becoming an academic in the United States. It, it did give one a wonderful sense of continuity that there were, you know, these amazing people before me and many people like after me, right, that we have this community. Okay, on that note, let's get to, <laughs> let's get to business. All right, so this paper is titled The Impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act on, the, on U.S. Economic Development. This is a joint work with uh, two graduate students. One, Joe Long, he's already working in industry. Carlo Medici is a current student at Northwestern. And Marco Tabellini is on faculty at Harvard Business School. OK. So I'm going to have to turn my head a little bit to see the slide sometimes. You know, um, why don't we start this project? Well, you know, throughout history, uh, I, throughout history, it's pretty common, it's a common phenomenon to see economically successful minority groups be restricted in some way or another, and, or limited. And it varies, you know, exactly how they're restricted or limited will vary from place to place and time to time. In one extreme, you just have people being expelled, right? So well-known examples of that are the Jews being kicked out of Spain, later on pogroms out of Eastern Europe. And a lesser, uh, a more nuanced, a more, nu uh, a more nuanced example of that would be an immigration ban. Immigration bans don't kick people out who are already here, right? They just stop new entry. And this is something that has been imposed historically. And it's also something, as you know, that has been discussed recently, both in the US and in Western Europe. So one thing, I'll, uh, I'll just foreshadow this a little bit, which is this talk is going to be historical, but I wanted to save a few minutes at the end for us to talk about about how it connects, like what, what do we learn from these histor uh, the his our historical experience? Like how does it inform, how can it inform our discussion today? Which at least I find to be very interesting. Okay, so you know, and today in democracies, we can't, we don't just kick people out, but we can, we are allowed to impose immigration bans. And they are typically imposed on small groups who don't vote. And the economic effect is actually ambiguous ex ante, right? On the one hand, you might think that getting rid of some people, like anyone, but getting rid of some people can free up resources for the people who stay, and that makes those people who stay better off, right? You know, if you think someone is taking your job and you get rid of them, then, and they leave, or they don't come, if you think a new entrant is going to take your job and com or compete down the wages, if they don't come, then your wages will be higher, and that's good for the natives. On the other hand, if you think that those new entrants, those immigrants who are no longer coming, if they're contributing to raise productivity, like economic productivity in the economy, then not letting them come could actually be bad for everyone. And the truth is, before... We don't really know how it's going to go until we look at the data. So that's why this is an empirical question. And as an empir as uh, for empirical economists, we found it interesting and challenging to study this question. Where is the? Should I aim at you? Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so. Uh, 
Let me just, for those of you who don't know about the Exclusion Act, you know, it was the first immigration ban of an entire ethnic group or a country of origin in the U.S., and it was effective until the, uh, it was de facto effective until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. And I'll give you more details about the act in a little bit. Um, and I, this I'll just go over really quickly. For those of you who aren't economists and wonder what uh, empirical economists do about topics like this these days, uh, or for those of you who are economists and want to do research quickly uh, in, in this area, I'll just say quickly that you know um, we're related to several recent s studies. So there's been several studies looking at the development of the American West, like the frontier. Uh, there's been several studies showing that the depopulation of Eastern Europe of Jews usually lead to permanent negative consequences. Uh, other studies that have looked at related things look at wars, right? They show that bombing during World War II or, or, or Vietnam depopulate and is really bad for the region. But then in those cases, the economy usually rebounds. And finally, you know, there's been a couple of really nice studies by Chinese American economists looking at the effect of the Exclusion Act on the Chinese who remained. And they're fascinating. I wanted to mention this because our study, you know, we are, so given that these studies already exist, our study is really going to focus on the economy as a whole and the white native. So I'll show you what happens to the Chinese, but that's not really our focus because people have already done it. We want to see, you know, those people who are supposed to benefit from getting rid of the Chinese, how did they, did they actually benefit? <sighs> Maybe if I switch hands. Oh, there you go. So um, I'm going to talk about the background. I'll spend some time to flesh out the story. And then I'll very quickly tell you how we estimate things in intuitive terms. I'll tell you the data we use, and I'll show you the results. I'll j I have a lot of slides for results. I'll just show you a few. Most people don't love to look at slides with tiny, tiny numbers right before dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so something happened. Okay, great. So Chinese immigrants first arrived in the United States starting in the 1850s. They came for the gold rush. The gold soon ran out, but then the Chinese came to build the Trans-Pacific Railway. And that mostly was done by 1880 also. So by 1880, you know, there, uh, between 1870 and 1880, 138,000, 139,000 mostly young men came from China to work in the U.S. And in terms of the total population in the U.S., the Chinese can, uh, made up a tiny, tiny fraction. So oh, there were 4.3% of all US immigrants. And immigrants at the time was around 20% of the entire population. So the Chinese were less than 1% of US population. However, in the West, they were more, in the, uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't, uh, they were concentrated in the West. There were very few Chinese in the East. So in the West, the Chinese were actually, uh, they were the largest immigrant group, right above the Irish and the Germans. So in 1880 in California, for example, 25% of all immigrants were Chinese, ahead of the Irish who were 22% and Germans who were 14%. And I, wanted to, I want to make a few remarks about the way the Chinese immigrants were organized. So Chinese immigrants, and this is, a, this is just a legacy of the railroads companies, actually. So Chinese immigrants usually came in groups. Yeah, and it was very organized. They almost entirely came through the port of San Francisco, and the trip was organized by uh, companies. So these were actually Chinese companies out of Guangzhou, and they or they would recruit and organize men to come to the U.S. and work for the railroad companies. And so you know they would take care of the boat trip or well, the ship. These are large ships. They would take care of transportation. They would take care of occupation. So they were all fully employed. Employed, right, And because it was so organized, another thing that happened was that young men usually came with their friends 
and their brothers. And then later on, you know, they would write letters home and their cousins would come and then more people would come. Quite often, you know, entire part, entire villages would eventually come to the U.S. via these uh, in, via these contracts. Entire villages of men. There were very few women <laughs> because you're all coming to work. And it's, this is just important to keep in mind when we think of the organization, the economic organization of the Chinese in the 1880s. Basically, we had people of all skills, um, of all ages within the range of being you know, able to work. And they knew each other, and they worked together, and they often f uh, formed companies together, right? They would have manufacturing firms, and they would be mining teams. And by 1880, the railroads were mostly completed, but these groups of Chinese, most, again, mostly men, they had found other jobs, and they were still working together. Okay. And the, with the, how did they work together? Um, so let me give you, let me move on to the next slide. Okay, they worked in all sorts of sectors. By, by 1880, they were working across sectors. They were still very concentrated in mining. The gold was gone, but the West was mining for lead, copper, so on and so forth. Uh, there was some in farming, a lot in services, like laundering services, serv railroad services. By then, railroad construction had been almost uh, completely finished. But there's still railroad services, right? The maintenance of the railroad, uh, which was very labor intensive and skill intensive. And one thing we didn't know, I, I, I didn't know this before I started uh, the study, was that even though the Chinese were only 25% of all immigrants in the West, they were very concentrated in certain locations and certain sectors. So for example, 50% of all cigars being, rolled cigars being produced from the West were produced by the Chinese. Something like 70% of milliners, these are people who make hats, were produced by the Chinese in the West. And uh, salmon canneries, this is like an industry that I would have never thought about before this study, in the Pacific Northwest, salmon canning was a really big industry, and half to two-thirds of all the workers were actually Chinese. And the, the reason we know this, and also you know lumber mills and so on and so forth, and the reason we know this was that when politicians pushed for the Exclusion Act, the only people, this was extremely popular across the board, Democrats, Republicans, every state. We started the study actually by trying to see if we can explain the differential support for the act across regions. We didn't do that because there is no differential support. Everyone loved it, like in terms of, uh, you know, voting, congressional voting patterns that we can observe. But... The, the very few people who spoke against it, besides the Chinese themselves, were actually the owners of mines, salmon canneries, and that's how we have these numbers, because they were writing letters to their legislators saying, don't pass this. If you pass this, it'll be the end of, like, it'll be the end of our county mining, right? We're going to just shut down. It'll be the end of my factory. I'll have to shut down. So that's how we have these numbers, because we have these documents from uh, 100 years ago. Okay, so the reason I'm taking so long to kind of paint the landscape is we're going to find huge numerical <laughs> results that without understanding the lay of the land, like how important that the Chinese were to certain sect like very important sectors, it's, gonna, it's hard to make sense of how big our results are given what a small share of the total population were, right? That's why I'm spending so time to paint the landscape and make it clear that the Chinese, although few in number compared to the total American population, even the total Western population were very, very important in specific sectors in the West. And they were working together in units, uh, often for Chinese owners, like the Chinese also owned factories, but also as teams for factories or establishments owned by you know, Americans, other Americans. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the Exclusion Act. <clears throat> 
Um, so it really built up from the during the 1870s. The U.S. experienced a recession. So you know the gold mines were long gone. The silver mines were drying up. There were fewer and fewer jobs, and there was this view that the Chinese were stealing the jobs, right? And you know, in those days, uh, well as now, you know, race and ethnicity it was very apparent. So this was just like a very visible group, and this got a lot of attention, and this got a lot of political traction, and so part. Part of the concern was economic, part of it was social, you know, so there was a lot of xenophobia and this was a period, you know, this was an inglorious period in American history with respect to xenophobia and race. So, it, I mean, people were pretty openly racist, right? The establishment was an Anglo-white establishment and they wanted to preserve it. So they're pretty open about wanting to get rid of the yellow peril, so to speak. Okay. And in 1882, uh, the government, the federal government imposed a nationwide ban of new Chinese entrants. In 1884, they added a ban of re-entry. Um, and then and later on in 1917, they added other Asians to the Exclusion Act, with the exception of uh, the Philippines and Japan. And in 1924, they set quotas for all countries, right? They set quota, in 1924, the Immigration Act set quotas for every country proportional to their 1890 population share in the US. This was basically a way to get, uh, to stop the flow of Southern and Central Europeans. So basically, uh, the point of this is to say that this act that seemed not very big in 1882, since it only applied to one, it was only meant, uh, this act literally take, taken literally stops additional inflow of a group that at this point is 1%, less than 1% of the total population. This was actually, you know, the big, it was actually binding until 1965. Okay. So, these are, this is an old newspaper article, and then this is an old uh, proper political comic. And um, you, you can't really, the letters are too small for you to read, but really the point, uh, we, we wanted to make the point that it wasn't just Democrats or Republicans or Northerners or Southerners. Everybody wanted this, and the, everyone except the Chinese and the establishment owners supported this in 1882. Okay, so what am I going to do empirically? So this is a tricky thing, right? If, uh, like, what would you do to understand how the Exclusion Act affected the U.S. economy? So one thing you can do is you can say, well, let me just look at California before and after the introduction of the Act and see how it changed. And I'll call that change the impact of the Exclusion Act. Well, that's really tricky to interpret because a lot of other things were happening in the United States during the late 1800s and beginning of 1900s. I mean, huge things were happening, right? Like industrialization and structural transformation. So we can't just compare before and after 1882. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something slightly different. What I'll do is. I'm going to first separate U.S. counties into those that had any Chinese or had a lot of Chinese in 1882 and those that didn't. And then I'm going to assume that if you didn't have any Chinese to begin with, the act doesn't affect you. But if you had a lot of Chinese people to begin with, then the act affects you. So then I'm going to do that before and after 1882 comparison in each type of the counties. Uh, that's my first difference. And then I'm going to compare that first difference across counties, and that's my second difference. So we call it a differences in differences estimate. And why is that important? Because those things that are happening in the US that have nothing to do with the Exclusion Act, like the Industrial Revolution, they're happening everywhere in the US, right? So when I look at the counties that don't have any Chinese and I see how they change over time, well, that tells me the effect of the Industrial Revolution. So 
I can look at the counties that have a lot of Chinese. I see how they change over time, and then I take out the difference. I take out the the change that's happening in the counties with no Chinese because that's the industrial revolution effect, and then what's left is the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right. That's the logic of this estimate. So that's what I'm going to do, and this is just a mathematical representation of that. So I'll just say it out loud for those of you economists out there. I'm going to regress. This is a linear regression. I'm going to regress uh, some economic measure of a county I and state J in your T on the interaction effect of how many Chinese were in this county in 1880. That's the last census that was taken before the act interacted with the dummy for posts, whether it's now after 1882. I'll control for state year fixed effects and county fixed effects. Okay, so if you're not interested in econometrics, totally ignore it, it doesn't matter. If you are interested in econometrics, or actually, yeah, this is for everyone. One thing that we need to remember is that the Chinese didn't go to places randomly, right? They chose places that were good for them in some way or another. So one concern you might have is, what if the places they chose were places that were already on the decline anyways? They were going to go on the decline anyways. So whatever effect, negative effect we find, this is just spurious. So we're going to ad address this. This is like our key econometric difficulty. So e uh, economists call it omitted variable bias. Other fields have different words for the same uh, challenge. So what we're going, we're going to, I'm going to do two sets of things. The first thing is I'm going to try to use the data to understand how they chose where they went, and I'm just going to control for it in my baseline. So it turns out that in, the data tells us the Chinese are much more likely to go to a place. In a, they're much more likely to live in a place in 1880 if it's connected to a railroad or has ever had a mine. Which makes sense, right? Because the first cohorts of Chinese immigrants worked in mining and, ro and the railroad. So my baseline, I'll just control for that. So all of my estimates, are holding, I'll be holding that constant. And later on, I'll do, I'll do fancier stuff to address it after the baseline estimation. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about our data. We use the historical censuses. We use the population census. We use the, uh, this, is, uh, this, this one is often called just the manufacturing census. And then the, this one is often called the agricultural census. Um, so we use the historical censuses, which allow us to measure a lot of things at the county level and the decade level. And the censuses have this, the population censuses also tell us the ethnic, the ethnicity, the race, or the uh, country of origin of a person. So in our sample, 87% of all of the men, all of the, all of the people are men, and most of my estimates are focus on the men. Uh, just, just that's what most immigration studies do, because especially about the West, because they're mostly men. But I do look at women, and actually doesn't change things very much, which is not surprising because there's just very few Chinese women in this period. There's also very few white women on the frontier during this period. Okay, and then how, what do we call some, well, how do we define a Chinese person? Well, in the census, you, Chinese shows up in two places. It shows up as a race, so one of the racial categories is Chinese. It also shows up as your country of origin. And so we call, we call someone Chinese if either their race is Chinese or their country of origin is Chinese. And we do this because in 1882, the Chinese immigrants are so new, it's almost the same. There are very, very few native born, sorry, in our sample, there are no native born Chinese men in 1880 or 1890. And the reason is because I'm gonna be looking at the adult labor force, right? So even if the, a Chinese person who came in 1870 had a baby, or two Chinese people who came had a baby in the US, uh, they're still not working by 1890. Okay. The other reason we define Chinese this way was because the policy was largely motivated by racial concerns, so it just made sense. Okay, so what is our sample? So our main analysis is just going to use uh, any state that has at least 1% Chinese in the population. Um, 
So this is these western states here, but I am going to have every county in that state. So some counties have no Chinese at all, and some counties have a lot of Chinese. And you see the darker the county, the more Chinese. So it's really, really dark blue near San Francisco, but there's, it's, that's not the only place with a lot of Chinese. I can also use the whole country. It doesn't change anything simply because there are no Chinese in the rest of the United States during this time. Okay, now let me show you some figures. Here, what you see, this is a, let's look at the white, uh, the white, white immigrants. This is a green line, and we want to use this axis. This is just each census telling us how many white men are born outside of the United States. And this is a stock. So you see it's growing, growing, growing. This is, this is the age of mass migration for the US. So immigrants are coming. A few of them go home. Most of them stay. And then more immigrants come. They also have babies. I mean, some die, but they also have children. So it's just going up, up, up. And uh, this, this is in the thousands, right? So this is, four, this is 4 million. And then it goes up to 14 million. OK. Now let's look at this axis, this, when we can look at Chinese and other races. Now let's look at, these are the Chinese, and there are many fewer of them to begin with, uh, but the trend just going up, this blue line is parallel to this green line until 1880. 1880, it starts to come down, or you can say that it's, it just stops growing. And remember, this is the stock. So this is, these are how many people born in China are classified as Chinese are living in the US. They're growing, 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 like white immigrants, like European immigrants. All the white immigrants are from Europe, obviously. And then they just stop growing while the white immigrants keep going. And so what's happening is that the inflow stops. That's the ban, with very few exceptions. And then a lot of the people who are here actually go home. Because remember, it's 83% men, young men. They, need to, they, they want to get married. They, they were planning to you know, bring their brothers or their cousins over, and now they can't. So a lot of them actually go home. And uh, it's not just home. They leave the US. They also go to Canada, which later imposes a similar ban. They go to Latin America, so on and so forth. They exit the United States. OK, now let me give you some more descriptive statistics. And this is just telling um, you, like, what are the Chinese doing in 1880 in the American West? And what you see here is that, so this is th the number of Chinese workers as a share of all workers. So they're 12% of the West. So it's actually, even without breaking it up into sectors, they're not a negligible, I mean, this is a big share of the labor force. When you look at certain sectors, like, manu uh, like mining, they're 22%. For railroad, they're 21%. And if you look at skilled, so they're 3% of all skilled workers and 23% of unskilled workers, and they're 10% of all literate workers. So that's just the average. But they're not evenly dispersed across space, right? There's a lot of geographic concentration and sectoral concentration. And how do we see that? We see that in the standard deviations. So this is just the variance. You know, the variance is huge. And so what, what does that reflect? So in, uh, in our sample, the, count, the maximum, the county with the highest number in terms of Chinese workers as a share of manufacturing, it's 64%. So there's a county in the West where 64% of all workers in manufacturing are Chinese. There's a county in our sample, and, and it's not just like one county, right? There's one that's like 62%, 59, 50, and a bunch of zeros, obviously, at the other end. And the same thing for mining. I mean, there's a county in our sample where 60% of all the workers and mining are Chinese. So we want to keep that in mind when we think about what's going to happen when the Chinese, uh, when the ban is imposed, right? It's not going to affect every county similarly. OK, so despite being quite experienced at this point in t giving presentations, I never get the font size right. Uh, yesterday, it was too big. I was at the University of Maryland, and it was way too big for the screen and the audience. So I made an adjustment, and now it's tiny. But uh, never fear. I am always happy to read off the numbers to you. 
Um, okay, so I'm actually, uh, so really, never, don't worry, I'm not going to read off every number to you. I'll just tell you what we're finding. So what I'm looking at here, here I'm actually doing that econometric comparison. I'm looking at total population. This is total Chinese population, total Chinese labor force, total Chinese labor force in, um, this is too small even for me. Okay. Oh dear, okay, urban share. Thank you. So this is total population, uh, urban population as a share of total population, total labor force, total labor force in manufacturing and mining and railroads and agriculture. On the bottom, I'm gonna look at how many literate workers are there, how many skilled workers, unskilled workers, managers, and the occupational income score. That just tells us whether they're working in a high income occupation or a low income occupation. I take all these variables, because these are the ones that I can observe in the historical census, and I analyze it with that baseline equation. So I take this variable, like let's say uh, population, this is the total number of Chinese male population in a county uh, in a given year, and I compare the counties that had a lot of Chinese before the act to those that had very few Chinese before the act, before and after the act. And what I find is a big negative effect. And what does that mean? It means that in the places that had a lot of Chinese, in the counties with a lot of Chinese before the act, they experienced a much larger decline in Chinese population than the places that had very few Chinese before the act. That almost has to happen because the other places had very few Chinese, so you can think of it as a sanity check, right? Did the productivity drop in those counties where the Chinese were evicted? I'm going to show you, yes, a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show you. So I do this for, this is all the Chinese, everything is negative. So the labor for some population estimates, it almost has to happen, it's mechanical. But the interesting thing is we see that the drop happens for workers for all skill levels, right? It's not like just one, it's not unskilled or skilled, all the Chinese are leaving more in the counties with more Chinese. Okay, so these even tinier numbers, are uh, ironically even more interesting. <laughs> uh, it was unintended irony. So these tiny numbers, these are the white workers. So panel A, this is the white natives. These are white people, white men, whose country of origin is the United States. And these are white men whose country of origin is not the United States. These are white immigrants. I look at those same variables now, this is the reason this is very interesting is remember what we're really interested to know in our project is okay, so you know, the Exclusion Act, it sucks for the Chinese. We know that, that's obvious. But it was meant, this, this policy was meant to benefit the natives and the white population. Well, it, did it achieve that, right? It's a self interest policy. How did it go? It turns out it didn't go very well. So, all of these tiny numbers are negative and they have a lot of stars on them. And having a lot of stars for applied economists <laughs> means that we're really happy because they're really precise estimates. And so we're very happy about the stars and very sad for these white workers because of their negative coefficients. So what, seri take, uh, seriously, so what this means is that when we, the, when we compare a county that had a lot of Chinese workers before 1880, to one that didn't have any Chinese before 1880, the one that had a lot of Chinese 1880 experienced much slower growth in the white labor force for every single sector, in white employment for every single sector, compared to the county that didn't have any Chinese to begin with, right? So in, that's why in relative terms, it's negative. They experienced a relative decline. And again, it's across the board. All sectors, all skill levels, managers, you know, unskilled workers. And you mean negative growth after they were evicted, not when they came? Yes, after. So after the Chinese were kicked out, everyone did worse off. So when we look at female workers, it's the same for white and non-white female workers. Um, 
Okay, when we look at all, when we look at everyone all together, it's the same, but that's not surprising because most of the workers are white. Okay. When we look at the dynamic of the effects, right, before I just said before and after 19, 1880, 1882, I can also look at it every single year. And what you see here is that there's really no change in these outcomes before 1880, but after the act, that's when the relative decline happens for everyone and everything, and the, it's permanent. Our last, the last year we have data for is 1940. That's the last historical census. And as of 1940, we don't see any rebound. And it's true for every single um, outcome. How many more minutes do I have? Oh, five. Five until the end of the hour, or five to the end of 35 minutes. I totally lost track. Uh, I teach MBAs now. I can time to your to demand. <laughs> okay, five more minutes. All right. So uh, these are all the things that econometricians and applied economists worry about. I'm going to skip over the boring ones and talk about the exciting ones. Right. So one exciting, uh, exciting. Like I think uh, less. M m Okay, I, I, won't, I, won't, I don't have time to explain why I find it more exciting. I'll just talk, talk about it. So one concern is relocation. I've been comparing places that had a lot of Chinese before 1880 to places that didn't. And I said, look, these guys grew less, so that's like a relative decline, right? But what if these guys actually, what, wait, something, sorry, something very important happened. So. Oh, so a slide disappeared, so that's not good. Let me see. Oh, yeah, I want to spend my last five minutes talking about this. Uh, these, kind of, these got skipped. Okay, so you asked about productivity. So we don't, in the historical data, it's hard to estimate productivity the way we do for modern data. But instead, what we can do is we can just look at output, right? Like manufacturing output and other things. And when we look at, well, so in these data, we don't know the ethnicity of the workers, but we can still do that comparison. And what we find is that in the places where there were more Chinese before the act, and, what, and I already showed you, they lost Chinese workers and all other workers, we see an accompanying decline in manufacturing output. And we see an accompanying decline in average wages paid by manufacturing establishments. This is the wage bill. We see a decline in the number of manufacturers. So this is, a ver this is kind of a stunning number. This is just telling you that entire factories are just shutting down and closing shop. And the, um, and the same thing for mines, like entire mines are shutting down. And if you take these estimates literally, what it says is that, for example, take a county that had 12% Chinese beforehand and compare it to a county with no Chinese beforehand. The county that had the Chinese workers beforehand lost the Chinese workers and experienced a 57% decline in manufacturing output compared to the other county, right? So these are really big effects. Okay, and the last slide I'll show you is, uh, the second last slide I'll show you is agricultural value. So agricultural output, these are just the data we have access to. Again, we see negative effects on everything. Farmland value goes down by around a bit under 40%. There's fewer horses, fewer livestock, fewer machines, less agriculture, less fertilizer spender. It's just... Uh, People are just moving out, right? These counties are just getting depopulated, both in terms of people and economic activity. Okay. This is the last result I'll show you since I'm uh, hitting time. So one thing you might wonder is um, what would have happened if uh, what would have happened to these counties if the Chinese weren't kicked out? 
And th that's a hard question to ask, but um, one way to do it with the data is to say, well, let's find the counties. Uh, let's see those counties that got a lot of Chinese people, immigrants in 1880. Let's see what they look like in the data, right? What attributes, what empirical attributes those counties have. Let's identify the same counties in the eastern United States, like the ones that are close to Ellis Island instead of San Francisco, the ones that had a mine, the ones that had a railroad, and like a bunch of other stuff actually in the data. And let's see what happened to those counties in the eastern United States, which wasn't affected by the Chinese Exclusion Act. They kept getting their European immigrants. Uh, after 1882. Did they also decline? Did they not change? Or what happened? And we find something very striking. So this, this is panel B. We're looking at Chinese labor force, all labor force, manufacturing output, number of establishments, and farmland. We find that they grow, actually, with the exception of one metric. They grow along every other metric. And this makes sense to us, right? Because the places that are attractive to a Chinese immigrant in the West is the same type of a place that's attractive to a European immigrant in the East. In the East, they kept getting immigrants, and these places were booming. So this is our counterfactual. Had we not had the Chinese Exclusion Act, not only would they have not declined, they would have grown more than the other places. And I'll just, um, I'll just end here in terms of results. I think it's pretty clear what we want to show with our results. The Chinese Exclusion Act was very damaging for economic development of the West. And then um, I promised that we would talk about implications for today. So the implication of our results, if you believe it, is not that you know, the opposite of not having a ban is not, uh, the opposite of a ban is not freeing up borders and having no controls for immigration. The the ban is a little bit different, right? Because the ban, what the ban did was it took very productive immigrants and it essentially encouraged them to leave. And so the implication for today is that when we're discussing, well, broad-based bans without careful considerations is probably not a good idea. And what should we think about when we're having this discussion? We should think about not just on average how many workers there are from this particular group, but how concentrated are they in certain locations and in certain sectors? What are they doing? And how easy is it to replace these workers? And here, obviously, I'm sidestepping any social and political issues. I'm just talking about self-serving economic interests of the United States, right? Because that we're going we, the rest we can save for drinks, but just in terms of self-interested, the self-interested US government or European government, when they're thinking about helping people here by imposing a ban, they need to think about all of these things before they start talking about policy. Well, in, in the design of their policy. Okay, I'll just stop there. Thanks. Maybe we can take some questions. Uh, Nancy, would you like to have a seat, or you would prefer to stand there? Either way is fine. Any any questions? No, no, no. I can use one of them before. Oh, okay. the, the, I can use yeah. that. Yeah, oh, maybe I ask the first question while waiting for other people to ask a question. The um, um, uh, your uh, very interesting uh, difference in difference in methodology uh, in your in your storytelling. You assume the towns with very little Chinese immigrants are not affected by the act. Is there a way, what if the towns that have very few Chinese uh, immigrants in 1880 actually benefit from the act? Like what are the things in the data that help you to rule that out? So in other words, it, it's possible that towns with uh, prior Chinese population get decimated by the act, but the other towns not only boomed, but they were boom they boomed because of the act. Like, how, how do you rule that out? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Shen Yu's question is basically, right now I'm comparing counties that had a lot of Chinese people in 1880 to those that don't. And I find that in relative terms, the Chinese, the counties with a lot of Chinese uh, immigrants in, went into a relative decline, right? And right now I'm interpreting the relative decline as a decline, that they're doing worse off, and then I'm saying the American West 
Based on that, the American West did worse off. And Shanjing is saying, but what if it's a case that they just relocated, that the factory moved from the county with a lot of Chinese to the county without a lot of Chinese, and those counties actually grew. So this relative decline isn't that the West uh, overall went into a decline, but that, uh, but that there was just a relocation of production. And so the way we look at that is we say, well, if that's the case, uh, that is an entirely possible. So Xanti, we, I mean, we, this is just something you ask the data, right? You don't know. So as long as, but as long as we assume that the cost of relocation is lower if for closer moves, right, which is pretty reasonable, I think, what we can do is we can look and see what happens uh, to counties that are adjacent, that are neighboring counties that were affected by the act. If there's this type of spillover, geographic relocation, then the counties that are living, that are next to counties that were really affected by the act should experience an increase in output, right? And we look at that and we find nothing. If anything, they also experience a decrease. So we don't see a deagle, uh, we don't see relocation, we see evidence. I would say just statistically not super strong evidence of deglomeration. Like the more that people around me are losing, the more Chinese workers, the more negative that it impacts me. Very good. Questions um, from the audience? Yeah, Tom, please. Thanks so much, it was a great talk. Um, I know this is a much more complicated problem to attack, but you have these great methodologies, so I wonder if you could address them. So. Uh, you got your PhD at MIT. I taught there for five years, and I can remember when people talked about uh, national security and foreign grad students and postdocs, that uh, the real scientists at uh, MIT, not like uh, the political scientists and economists, but the, the real scientists at MIT um, would, say, would point out that in certain fields, you, you really couldn't run the labs without foreign grad students and, um, and postdocs in any kind of competitive, globally competitive way. Uh, they were too dependent on, on the students and the postdocs. And many of those labs were, had heavy representation of uh, Chinese and South Asian graduate students. I just remember that from, this was now 20 years ago. Um, so the argument was, you know, be careful if you think that you're somehow going to boost American economic power by putting Americans in those spots. You know, you're not going to be able to actually have the personnel. But then the counter argument is those people then go, a lot of them anyway, and increasingly these days, not so much then, will go back to China or back to India and create industries there that compete with American industries. So I wonder if there was some way to, if you think about it in a competitive realm in an area that say has national security implications, like uh, very high level art artificial intelligence, lasers, things like that, would you be able to use any of these methods to determine the relative competitiveness of a United States that is open not only to the students and postdocs coming in but also going back home to one that is more closed off and doesn't have them. I mean, I, you can tell from my question what my gut sense is, but I, I don't have the skills to actually prove it. So, so I think that's a great question, and I think um, I think it's a paper waiting to be written. Um, if it's not, uh, yeah, and it's really just an issue of data, which I think is actually becoming more and more available these days. So the way I think about it, I've actually thought about this a lot because my father is an electrical engineer, trained in the U.S., and he left academia because. He, uh, you know, this was he finishes. This was during the Cold War. He could never get. He could never be the PI of any contract because he was right. born in China, yeah. and that's what it takes to get tenure, right? As an electrical engineer. So he went to industry. So, and then since then we get a lot of calls from the FBI saying, you know, who are you talking to in China? Um, so I've actually thought about this a lot, and I think you know. And you know, and I've read a lot about scientists, you know, Russian, Chinese scientists, Jewish scientists that have come here who worked in the Manhattan Project. You know, that's the famous example. And obviously, like the recent issues that have come up in the newspaper. And honestly, you know, the way I think about it is, 
some leakage when you know it's like when you have this type of collaborative studies and nurturing, some leakage is impossible, right? So, th so the goal is not to have no leakage of knowledge. The goal is to get more, to gain more right. than you lose, right? Yeah. And I think once you think about it that way, then you think about, well, when do things leak and when do we get gains, big gains? Um, and also, I just want to note, like, despite all these concerns, America seems to be doing very well in terms of like keeping its uh, immigrant brain power uh, for the U.S. But I think, you know, the way I think about it is that, you know, some leakage is impossible. People talk, people move. It's just a way of life. Maybe someone will get a nice contract or a lab built in Germany or China or wherever, and they'll go there. And that's not ideal from U.S. national security. On the other hand, historically, most of them stay. And why do they stay? They stay because it's a really nice country to live for them. They build families here. They, they make friends, even if their friends are like other Chinese students, right? But people typically end up living in a place that's nice to live. So I think, you know, what I think would be really interesting to study, and my hunch is that this would be true, is to look and document, and we, we have data on publications and where people work on, um, and even now we, we can see where people get their PhDs because PhD theses in recent years have been digitized or on digital libraries, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean, data is becoming more and more available. At some point you can link all these data and I think it would be really interesting to see how the flows of knowledge and just physical location of people vary depending on uh, uh, pro-immigrant versus anti-immigrant per perceptions in the United States, like how welcome people feel, feel. And also, you know, controlling for other things, like how many, how much economic incentives is the Chinese government giving for these people coming back, right? I think it's really an empirical question. And my gut is that making a place nice to live, like, you know, not just for that person, but as we see, you know, for the household, for their brothers, for their family, for their children, I would guess that that goes a long way in keeping the person here and keeping, you know, the, the human capital here. Okay, thank you. Great question and great answer. Let's look for another great question. <laughs> Please. <laughs> thank you. I, thank you. I enjoyed the talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One, the first is a, a clarification. So the Exclusion Act um, restricted just immigration or also restricted the stock of the population and forced them out, because I wasn't clear on that. And then um, my second question is maybe more technical, which is, um, you know, the, I think it's a Mundell theorem when you restrict something, something else moves. So if you restrict labor, uh, the labor supply, then what you do is import goods that um, had used that labor from outside of the country. And I'm wondering if there's any of that effect that gets, in the example I thought it was maybe millinery, uh, did millinery imports increase as a result of the reduction of the Chinese workforce in, in millinery? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, let me answer the first question, just a factual question. The law, the ban just banned new immigrants in 1882, and in 1884, it banned reentry. But uh, that was the literal law. But de, de facto, what happened was that people left, right? Partly, partly because it was 83% young men, and they wanted to get married. Um, partly because the law wasn't just a law. The law came to being because a lot of anti-Chinese sentiments. So one thing I didn't talk about was, you know, socially, this was an incredibly unpleasant period for Chinese people in the West. Uh, they were hounded. They were beaten up. Uh, there was a lot of there was a there was a lot of violence. And one of the things um, I learned through this project is that the Chinatown initially formed actually many ethnic enclaves in the US, including like Little Italy and New York. A lot of these ethnic enclaves form, and definitely Chinatown San Francisco, because the Chinese population after the Exclusion Act, those who remain, they retreated into these enclaves as a way of like actually like physical self defense against um, violence, right? And then it, it perpetuated. So the second question about um, 
what like the economic adjustments to the lo loss of this labor? I think that's a really interesting question. So one thing, um, it op uh, so one thing is that. The original pol so one thing we ask us is you know given that we find this and once you understand how important the Chinese were to certain sectors the findings aren't so surprising so we ask ourselves what were those policymakers thinking right uh, or, if they were thinking. or if they were thinking yeah no so one possibility is that they weren't thinking but if we are going to be like very generous to the uh, to the intellect of these policymakers. One possibility is that they thought, they overestimated how easy it would be to replace the lost Chinese workers, right? And there is some documentary evidence about this. Um, I mean, the language is terribly racist towards every single group. So I'm a little bit hesitant to even say it, but let me just paraphrase it in more academic phrase the terms. They basically said, you know, we'll lose these blank Chinese workers, and we can, rep but you know, we have millions of blank uh, Italians or Greeks coming from in every day, so we can just replace the blank Chinese with the blank Irish, like who cares? Like that's literally what these documents said, right? And that was a gross, uh, that was a mistake, you know, as we see, and once you look at, uh, I, I didn't have space, time for tonight, but if you look at a US map, it's just not surprising. In 1882, Chicago was a frontier of, you know, it was a frontier city. The great, it was like around the time of the Great Expo. And if you look at a map, Chicago is really, really far east. So the 19, the late 1800s and early 20th century, it's true that there were tons of immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe. They were settling in Wisconsin and Minnesota, right? California was like another 2,000 miles. They're not gonna come to California to work in salmon cannery when they can like you know do dairy farming in Wisconsin. So that's one thing that people thought should have moved according to economic theory, or if they were thinking, that didn't move. All right. Anyone else? Yes, please. Hi, thanks so much. I really enjoyed your remarks um, and learning about the economic decline of the U.S. due to the loss of Chinese labor and more specifically the slowing of economic growth uh, in the West Coast. Uh, my question has to do with, um, I guess, when did the U.S. government sort of change their policies and I guess make it more, I guess, inclusive or inviting for Chinese people to return to the U.S.? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So. Um, uh, I'll answer the question, and I'll also answer a question that you didn't ask, just because I find it so fascinating. So, uh, so 1965, together with the Civil Rights Act, and it wasn't by coincidence, right? So 1965 was a year of great reckoning for American legislators that basically we just can't base things on, you know, race and country of origin. Uh, so. Th uh, this, but the, I also tell you, uh, um, I found this really fascinating. So one thing that I learned is that, you know, we all think that in the, U the U.S. is so special because if you're born in the U.S. and you're an American citizen. It turned out this wasn't always the case. And this law was legislated due to a Chinese man that, that was uh, after the Exclusion Act. I, I'm going to mispronounce his name, so I won't try to say it. You can Google it. But um, he was a man born to two Chinese people, like a man, a Chinese two Chinese immigrants. He was born in the United States and he went to Guangzhou to visit family. And then, but this was like in 1885, I want to say, or 1884, they had just banned re-entry, so they wouldn't let him back in. So then he sued. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that if you're born on the U.S. territory, then you should have rights, even though his group, uh, if he wasn't born, like the ban was just about foreign born. And that legislation became the precedent of how we define U.S. citizenship ever since. Wow. Can you remind us of the case? Do you remember the name of the, case, the Supreme Court case? Um, I will email it to someone. Okay. Yes, that's right. I just didn't want to say it because I was going to mispronounce it. What's the name? You say it. His name was Wong Kim Ark. Wong that's Kim Ark. Yeah. At that time. Very good. Maybe we can take one more question. I, I will note, you know, Australia, another uh, democracy, had explicit. Uh, um, 
uh, immigration policy banning non-white all the way to 19, I want to 60s. It's called white Australian, Australian policy because they were hoping they were only uh, and they want they don't want other Europeans either. They were focused on getting the, the English, the British, but they there weren't enough uh, British uh, immigrating to. Uh, to uh, Australia, then the war came. The, you know, J J Japan was bombing Australia. They were yeah. they were concerned that they, the, their population was too small. This, after the war, there was a rush to expand the population. There were not enough English people wanting to move. Then they said, "Okay, let's open to the so to the Asians." One thing you talk, I just want to add a comment too. It's not a question. Uh, in, in the twenties and thirties, there were exclusion laws against Japanese, and that fed into Japanese politics very strongly as mm -hmm. the fascists came to yeah. power. Because moderate Japanese wanted good relations with the United States and with China. They tended to want both. They didn't want to invade. They wanted to, to, to trade. Um, and they had a hard time arguing in Japan that the United States was reciprocating when the United States had exclusion laws against Japanese immigrants. They said, how can you see them as a friendly country? They won't even allow us to go there. Um, they obviously hate us. And that was a big, a big part of the mobilization drive for the kind of fascist imperial efforts of Japan. And, the U.S. shot itself in the foot by excluding people and therefore feeding into the rise of fascists and future enemies. We can take one more question, if there's any. Yes, please. Um, oh, um, hi. So um, I was just wondering, because I noticed a lot of your um, like the map showed a lot of the West Coast, obviously, but did you also look at data from Hawaii or even Alaska, and did you find similar things there? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the answer, the answer is yes and no. So we considered Hawaii and Alaska, but they're not in our data set. I mean, they're not in this analysis, because, uh, which is too bad, especially for Hawaii, because Hawaii had a lot of Asians. Um, but the reason is because Hawaii was, a, was only a territory until 1948. So in these earlier censuses, so some of them, actually, Hawaii is not part of the data set. And when it is, Hawaii is just, there's no county, there's no counties within Hawaii, right? It's just like one, it's just one territory. So that's why it's not in this analysis. Okay. Um, be before I thank the speaker, let me say there is a reception. Uh, is it just outside the reception? Right uh, there is a reception here. Everyone uh, is uh, invited. Uh, now please join me in thanking our speaker for a wonderful, insightful. <laughs>